All right, we are live. Thank you for joining us today. Today we're going to be discussing the Hadith. Uh, this will be kind of an introductory video to the Hadith, but uh, don't think that means you know all the material because we as Christians have had the wrong Im impression of the Hadith. We're going to be looking at how Muslims judge the reliability, which is not the same way that Christians would, and what this implications this has for, you know, um, how they view the Bible and how they should view the Quran, but do not hold it to the same standards. So let me just go ahead and open us with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for the technology that allows us to connect with people around the world, whether they're believers or non-believers. We ask that any Muslims watching now or later on the replay approach the material with an open mind, that they not simply dismiss what we're saying because it's coming from Christians. All the material that we're going to use is referenced from Islamic sources, and Muslims need to be aware of what they actually believe um, or what, the, what their religion is actually based on, not just whatever notions they have in their own head. We ask that you guide our discussion today that anything that we say that is useful and beneficial is remembered and applied to people's lives, and anything that we say that is false is simply forgotten. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. So as I said, our subject for today is the Hadith, kind of understanding how Hadith work. You'll see in the thumbnail, we have a, a graphic illustration of the telephone game. Uh, it's called different things in different parts of the world. But for those who don't know, basically it's a children's game where one child whispers to the, one, one child comes up with a phrase and they whisper it to another and then to another and so on. And then by the time it gets to the last person, it's always garbled. It no longer was what the original message was. Um, of course, it's not a perfect analogy for the way Muslims do Hadith, but as we'll see, it is actually kind of close, a lot closer than you might think. I did want to say uh, a thank you to Chaco Kurian for a super chat from before we got started. No message, just a donation. So thank you very much for that. And I did want to let people know that Io was unable to join us today due to some computer issues, but he will be back again next time, hopefully. I have with me today a, a Lloyd de Jong. His uh, YouTube channel is growing. He is releasing, has started releasing material on that again. So be sure to head over and check out his channel. A link is in the video description box. Uh, anything you'd like to say as a word of introduction before I show this little hadith that I have f discovered in a Sahih collection? Um, yeah, not a lot. Yeah, I released this in four parts on my channel. So thank you for plugging that, Thaddeus, um, where I go through this. And I, um, the current um, presentation has been updated. And of the last section I did as a live stream, and I'm thinking of, and people have been asking, suggested, etc. I do occasional live streams, and I've been asked to do introductions to Islam fr from the basics, and just cover some of the terminology so that people can have an idea of, you know, an, an entry level understanding. So we all start on the same page. And those are things I'm thinking of. If you have suggestions, please put it in the comments, put it in the chat, and I will get on that. Excellent. So I'm going to go ahead and share the screen. I came across this hadith in a collection called uh, Sahih Reasoned Answers. It reads, Yahya related from Malik from Nafi that Abdullah bin Umar heard the prophet say, you don't get rich trading camels. If you want to get rich, you start a religion. Now, you may think that I just made this hadith up, but as you can see, it has this very extremely reliable uh, it's not at the top, which means it's reliable according to the standards of Islam. So this should be graded Sahih. Yeah. Yeah. Looks good to me. <laughs> of course, I, I'm just playing a game here. It's obviously, I just made this up myself. But you can see that the chain doesn't actually add anything to reliability. The chain can be made up just as easily as the Hadith itself. 
uh, Love All Moms did ask what your Christ what your channel name is, and it's just uh, Lloyd's name. And there is a link in the description box. Yeah, I will drop it in the comment in the chat now as well. Hmm. Oh, I have to find my yeah. Yeah, I'll have it. I'll, have to, I'll drop it in the chat in a little bit. Yeah, so if so you want to, I have enabled screen sharing so you can uh, load up the presentation whenever you like. Ah, there it worked. Oh my gosh, finally. Uh, <laughs> I made a wrong mistake. Uh, that is the link to my channel, youtube.com forward slash Lloyd de Jong. Uh, I just run it under my name. When I was living in the Middle East, I couldn't do that. <laughs> yeah, that would have got me in jail. Um, yeah, so let me start sharing. This would be here, and I share screen two. And here we go. <clears throat> uh, my screen has come up, right? Okay, yes. yeah, so as usual, I have about 4,000 slides, so we're going to be here for a week. I hope you guys have a packed lunch. Right, okay. Right, so we're going to be talking about the religion of broken telephone, the religion of hearsay, the religion of he said, she said, the, the telephone game religion. And um, yeah, so hopefully this will take you guys through the understanding of Hadith that is not the common standard narrative on Hadith and give you guys the tools you need to really ask the right questions and just as with the Asad Qadi, we can now start to ask questions that will go back to these scholars and make their lives very uncomfortable because Muslims need to know these things as well. So we're going to be, the, the narrative that I've been using is of course the telephone game, which I think is a very appropriate um, analogy. And notice this is quite literally how hadiths are spread and how they are authenticated. This, what you see here is quite literally what makes hadiths authentic. And according to the Islamic scholars, the fact of these narrations being passed on like this makes Islam authentic. Right. Yeah. Now, the major sources that I'm using, this video is actually very interesting. Proofs in Islam, 14. Uh, proofs in Islam, number 14. There's actually only two of them. I don't know how you call this 14. <laughs> <laughs> Islamic math there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Different types of hadith, mutawatir, mashhur, and ahad. Uh, you can look for it on that name. I'm also using what's called the Tafsir Sahih Bukhari, the Fat al-Bari. Now, what few people know is that there are Tafsir of the Hadith. Just as you have Tafsir written like Tafsir al-Jalalain and so on, Tafsir um, Ibn Kathir of the verses of the Quran, there are Tafsir written on all of the Hadith. In fact, Bukhari is the most famous of the Hadith writers, and there have been at least 70 Tafsir written on Bukhari, and the most important of these, the most highly regarded of these, is the Fat al-Bari by Sheikh al-Islam ibn Hajar al-Skalami. That's this guy here. And this one is published by Medina University in Saudi Arabia and Al-Azhar in Egypt, the two top Islamic seminaries in the world collaborated to do this. Then I'm using Reliance of the Traveler, which is the classic manual of Islamic sacred law. It is the standard Shafi and uh, in fact, it doesn't only have Shafi fiqh, it uses all four schools of fiqh, so it references a lot of them. And it's the standard Sharia law fiqh reference. And don't forget, something like 85% of the fiqh between the four schools is identical. So you can't say that the Shafi school is completely different. No, they're not. That's not true. I'm also utilizing the Brill Encyclopedia of Islam. This is the standard reference worldwide, used even by Muslims. A copy will set you back about $38,000. And of course, I'm using Mr. Yasser Qadi's um, PhD, Sheikh Yasser Qadi's, an introduction to the sciences of the Quran. There's not all the resources I'm using, but those are the major ones. So any comments yeah, so far, Thaddeus? And nope, uh, I, I'll just point out that, you know, we're not making this stuff up on like uh, people on YouTube comments. We're going to the most reliable Muslim sources, the most reliable uh, sources of information about Islam. Um, so, you know, if you want to dispute what we're saying, then you better have some pretty good sources yourself. Yeah, yeah, thanks. As I said, be aware that there are tafsir. Now, why don't we know about this? 
Now, understand hadith are filtered through the tafsir of the hadith, then it's filtered through the scholarly writing, then it's filtered into the sharia, and then it's filtered into the fiqh. So there's a number of steps that we're not aware of in terms of Islam. A couple of points I want to make, key takeaways. Islam has its own Talmud. The Muslim Talmud is the sharia. Right? Just as the Jews are the Talmud and people love attacking the Talmud, by the same token, you've got the Sharia. And hadiths, I want to make clear in this episode, hadiths abrogate the Quran. They supersede and they abrogate the Quran. Now, when I say supersede the Quran on dictionary.com, supersede means to replace in authority, effectiveness, acceptance, or use, to set aside or cause to be set aside as void, useless, or obsolete, usually in favor of something. Now, we don't have to necessarily take as much of an extreme stance there, but it, but these certainly will supersede, and I will show you that. Many hadiths are considered absolutely unfalsifiable, irrefutable, undeniable fact. Hadiths, not the Quran, are the proofs of Muhammad's prophethood, which has an interesting implication because it means that the Quran is not enough. The Quran is insufficient. Ask yourself why Muslims are constantly referring to the Bible as proof of Muhammad. What are your thoughts on that point, Thaddeus? Yeah, well, you know, if you're going by the, the Quran alone, you have numerous problems. But on this point, you have the problem that it tells you to obey the messenger dozens of times. Uh, I think more than 100 times, actually. It tells you to obey the commandment of the messenger. Mm -hmm. And yet there's only four verses in the entire Quran that mention Muhammad's name. So it's like, how are you obeying him if you're going by the Quran only? So they have to turn to external sources. Furthermore, they don't have enough confidence in the reliability of the Quran or the Hadith to prove that the, their case. So they have to go to the Bible and say, well, you know, according to your Bible, we're following the same God. According to your Bible, Muhammad's a prophet. And of course, it's utter nonsense. It's a total twisting of the Bible, but it just shows how little confidence they have in Islam. Uh, or you can see you can see this another way, in that no matter what we're discussing, we, we about Islam, we can you know be discussing Muhammad, we can be discussing the Quran, we can be discussing the Sharia law. It doesn't make any difference. Muslims will come into the chat and be like. Oh, but the Bible says, blah, blah, blah. You shouldn't follow the Bible. And it's like, well, that's not a reason to follow Islam. So do you have any actual reason to follow Islam? And then you get right. silence. Yeah, we're going to discover. No, thank you. Um, yeah, we're going to discover that the Hadith are what prove Muhammad's prophethood, not the Quran. And also, I want to point out that the, the whole doctrine of attacking Christianity rather than defending Islam is actually based on a doctrine created by a man called Ibn al-Jabbar. Ibn al-Jabbar is quoted extensively by Ibn Qayyim. We did a show on Ibn Qayyim recently. He's the guy that said to defend Islam, attack Christianity. And this became standard accepted doctrine. Uh, he's quoted extensively by Ibn Kathir as well. And this became the accepted method of defending Islam, not to assert Islam's truth, but to try to destroy the Bible and destroy Christianity. So that's something that, and that's a skull I need to dig into next. So hadiths, not the Quran of the proofs, and also Islam rejects biblical textual evidence. I'll, find, I'll show you that they have a completely different standard. Islam, though, relies on he said, she said. Now, the Bible is also not considered mutawatir, and these are people who prefer hearsay that say this. And Islam rejects Western standards and criteria of proof, hence they say the Bible is corrupted. Islam's word-of-mouth method is apparently superior in, in their view. Right, so let's see. I'll start showing exactly what I mean as I go through this. But first, we start with a fun fact, which is when men kiss the tongues of men, or shall I say, Islamic scholars decide to. Uh, Tustari is a very famous scholar, and he was near to the Islamic scholars of Hadith when he met Abu Dawood. Now remember, this is Abu Dawood is from the Kitab al Sitta, right? One of the six major Hadith collections. He said, "Oh, Abu Dawood, I want something from you." Abu Dawood said, what is it? Tustari said, on a condition that you say that you will fulfill it if possible. And Abu Dawood replied in the affirmative. Mm -hmm. Saul said, get out your tongue with which you narrated that deeds for the prophet so that I may kiss your tongue. So Abu Dawood accepted and Tustari kissed his tongue. Hashtag no homo. <laughs> this is great because, you know, he's like, 
I, I know you'll say no if you do what I want. So just agree to it first. <laughs> I'm like, this is not serious. That these guys on this this is actually quoted in plenty of places. Here's a couple of references here. You can look these up. I think they deliberately don't give us the exact place into Starry's um in his in his tafsir. He wrote a very famous tafsir. So he actually has the tafsir to study. And he wrote a number of interesting things. For instance, the whole the whole concept of saying subhanallah or, uh, you know, inshallah, that idea that that as a formal doctrine and practice in Islam actually comes from to study. He's the guy that formalized it as doctrine and said that this is actually will get you reward in paradise with Allah. So saying, you know, there's no deity but Allah, what's it like, ilah, 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 whatever. That, that idea of saying all these things, the dhikr, that to study codified into Islamic doctrine. Right, and saying Alhamdulillah, all of that, that's Dustari's work. But what's interesting is he says that there's a hadith. Now, again, I have tried to trace this down, and these guys don't provide the references, but it's you'll find it everywhere. There's a hadith, according to Tustari and the other scholars, where Muhammad says, I am he, and he is I, save that I am I, and he is he. And it, Muhammad is talking about Allah. Muhammad is saying, I am Allah, and Allah is me, save that. I am I, and he is he. Yeah, Does that make sense, that is? Well, it, it sounds a lot like the, the Christian concept of God, that, you know, God is multipersonal. So apparently we have the benignity of Islam, the, uh, Allah and Muhammad, one in one sense and two in another. Yeah, so look it up. I mean, seriously, look it up. You're going to find it. And if you can find the actual reference, the page, it's on the book, it's in, man, I'd love to, but... But this is all over the Islamic writings, but they, they don't give us, they don't want us to find it, I'm guessing. So what are the proofs of Islam, right? The proofs of Islam refer to the proofs that the mushtahids, they, these are the most qualified scholars in Islam, rely on when they deduce and describe the rules of Islam. Now, these proofs are the Quran, right? Divine scriptural revelation. The Sunnah, the oral tradition of Muhammad, which includes the Hadith and the Sirah that they love to hide. Then... This, the ijma, the consensus of the jurists. Notice I'm not saying consensus of the clergy, consensus of the priests, the consensus of the lawyers. And the kias, juristic logical argument or comparative analogy. So this is where you deduce a judgment for a case based on similarities to a case found in the religious text. So you find something close and you formulate a judgment, a law on that basis. Now, in Islam, human reasoning is supposed to be a secondary source. You've got the Quran is supposed to be the primary source, right? And however, so what, okay, so what we have here is we've got reasoning called ijtihad, right? This consists of the consensus known as the ijma, right? Or the ijma, as they'll say. Deduction by analogy, which is kias, which I've just described, and deduction by logic, which is akal. We can probably get rid of this one. I don't think they use it. Now... <laughs> consensus now how the ijma works if a legal solution is neither available in the quran or in the sunnah the hadith and the sirah islam allows muslims to find a solution which is agreed upon and accepted by the majority when they mean the majority they really mean by the scholars now the word ijma derives from jama to unite to assemble the community or the ummah now in legal terms and notice legal solution legal, not religious legal religion of lawyers, not clergy, lawyers. In legal terms, a procedure through which a principle of law is formulated by unanimous opinion. Also defined as the unanimous agreement of Islamic lawyers in a particular age on a given question of law. And in the Sharia, it is this is explicit in the Sharia, the Muslim community can never be wrong. The Muslim community can never make a mistake. They cannot be in error on any judgment, on any ruling, on any formal opinion based in their consensus. And this view is supported by both Quranic verses and Hadith proofs. And I will go into that. Any any comments or questions, Hadith? Yeah, well, you know, uh, to put it from a, a Christian perspective, this is like saying the infallibility of the, the Pope on steroids. Um, it's like any any jurist as long as they agree with the other jurists is infallible. You can't make any mistakes whatsoever. And of course, you know, in, in Catholicism, the infallibility of the Pope only applies to 
matters of doctrine and only in specific conditions. But here, you know, any opinion that has a majority is infallible, apparently. Apparently, it's impossible for the majority to be wrong. Yeah, sorry, you broke up there for me for just a moment. But yeah, they're, they're totally infallible. And I mean, that is a very, prof that's a crazy claim to make. Let's continue. Now, notice this is from the Encyclopedia of Islam, Ijtihad. Literally, effort in law, the use of individual reasoning, exerting oneself to form an opinion in a case or a rule of law, achieved by applying analogy to the Quran and the custom of the Prophet, the Hadiths. The opposite is called taqlid, the unquestioning acceptance of the doctrines of established schools and authorities. What they want is for the, the lay Muslim to practice taqlid and ijtihad has already been performed. So current scholars just apply the rulings. They don't make up new ones or rarely do they need to these days. Right, any, any questions from you? Any thoughts from you Thaddeus? Oh, we have a, a good comment here from Chaco. He says, Islamic law is all about straining gnats and swallowing camels. <laughs> you know, they're all about the, the details and missing the real important matters. Right. Now, the ijma in law, it is the third and in practice, the most important of the sources of legal knowledge. You'll find this commonly referenced. Ijma is actually, which is the consensus of the scholars. In other words, the scholars have hijacked Islam. The scholars are the ruling authority of Islam. They, they reign supreme over anything that else that, that exists within Islam. So it is the unanimous agreement of the community on a regulation imposed by Allah. Technically, it is the unanimous doctrine and opinion of the recognized religious authorities at any given time. Pardon me, at any given time. And now we find in the Brawl Encyclopedia of Islam. So understand, in practice, it is the most important of the sources of legal knowledge, the consensus. This we find in their writings, and we're going to be going through some of that. Brief word in the consensus. So indeed, Allah will not gather my ummah, or he said, Muhammad's ummah upon deviation, and Allah's hand is over the group, and whoever deviates, he deviates to the hellfire, Jamia Tirmidhi. So let's see how the Sharia deals with this. Allah's hand is over the group. Just as a side note, this is also, because of that hadith, this is where the scholars go now. Does Allah have only one hand? No, yeah, he's got two. Because <laughs> his hand. So understand he's or does he have one large hand? Seriously, <laughs> the questions these guys ask you. Anyway, so meaning his protection and preservation of the Ummah, signifying <clears throat> that the collectivity of the people of Islam are in Allah's fold. So be also in Allah's shelter in the midst of them and do not separate yourselves from them. And this is recorded by Tirbini, and he says, whoever descends from them departs to hell. And I think this is written specially to Yahya. Now, the meaning is that whoever diverges from the overwhelming majority concerning what is lawful or unlawful and on which the community does not differ has slipped off the path of guidance, and this will lead him to hell. The Jami al Sagir is a treatise on international law in Islam. Now, this goes on to say, in addition to general interest as a formal legal opinion, notice the hadith is a formal legal opinion. It's not, a, not an aspect of religion, it's a legal opinion. The following serves to clarify why, other than the four Sunni schools of jurisprudence, so any other schools do not play a role in scholarly consensus. There is scholarly consensus on its being unlawful, illegal, to follow rulings from schools other than those of the four recognized schools of jurisprudence. So when they start giving you doctrine from other schools and yeah, just throw it away, it's not relevant. Now it is quite, now they speak of establishing reliability. It is quite otherwise with the four schools whose imams spent themselves in checking the positions of the schools, explaining what could be rigorously authenticated. Okay, as to the position of the person it was attributed to and what could not be authenticated, their scholars have achieved safety from textual corruption and have been able to discern the genuine from the poorly authenticated. And this tells you exactly the same process is applied to the Hadith, just so the same process was applied to the Quran. And it's a religion of he said, she said, and this is how they verify the religion. And we'll get more into this. Shall I go on or we'll just pause for a moment, Thaddeus? Oh, let's, let's pause for a moment there. Uh, we have a comment from uh, the Thunderous One. He says, the Tafsir scholars are employed to clean up this 
mess. Irony is Muhammad said the first three generations were the purest. So today we have a bastardized Islam, bastardized by men. And of course that is true. It's one of one of one of many ironies. You know, he got all kinds of hadith that contradict the way Islam's actually done. And of course the Quran even more so. That, you know, we have this reliable hadith that says only the first three generations are are correct, collected by, you know, the sixth generation. And all the hadith are collected by like the sixth generation of Muslims or or thereabouts, um, or you know, eighth generation or tenth. The there there basically is nothing from the first three generations that still exists today, um, assuming the, tr the truth of the uh, traditional narrative about how Islam f was, was founded. We don't really have any material from these reliable three generations. All we have is this unreliable material. Yeah, precisely so. Yeah, they go on to say in section B7.3 of the Reliance of the Traveler, the proof of the legal authority of scholarly consensus is that just as Allah ordered the believers in the Quran to obey him and his messengers, so too he has ordered them to obey those of authority. That's the, that's the ulama among them saying, O you who believe, obey Allah and obey the prophet and those of authority among you. So in other words, these people have now taken on the authority of Muhammad and the authority of Allah after Muhammad left such that when those of authority in legal expertise, the mushtahids, agree upon a ruling, it is obligatory in the very words of the Quran to follow them and carry out their judgment. These people have taken over Islam. Allah threatens those who oppose the messenger and follows other than the believer's way. And who decides that way? The scholars. Whoever controverts the messenger after guidance has become clear to him and follows other than the believer's way, we shall give him over to what he has turned to and roast him in the hell. Quran 4. 115. And a second evidentiary aspect is that a ruling agreed upon by all the mujtahids in the Islamic community is in fact the ruling of the community represented by its mujtahids. And the community is divinely protected from error, including in the saying, my community shall not agree on an error. That's a hadith. Allah is not wont to make my community concur on misguidance that which the Muslims consider good, Allah considers good. What's interesting about this sentence is, it's not that that which Allah considers good, the Muslims consider good, but it's the wrong way around. Don't you think that is? Yeah, definitely. Um, th that's saying that the, the Muslims determine what's right and wrong, not God. Yeah, that's really interesting. That it's really uh, really honest, good. though, because that's the way things actually work. <laughs> exactly. So understand these these little. I know, it's almost like it's like Freudian slips within the, within their scholarly works, right? And in another hadith that scholars quote in connection with the validity of scholarly consensus is the following: Muhammad said, "Allah's hand is over the group, and whoever descends from them departs to hell." Meaning, whoever diverges from the overwhelming majority concerning what is lawful and on which the community does not differ has slipped off the path, and blah blah. And they repeat that. So. Yeah. So moving on. So hadith are wahi. Wahi means revelation. So hadith are considered secondary revelation, Allah's revelation. And they refer to the sayings, the actions, the attributes, and the approvals of Muhammad. Right. Now, these are their arguments, not mine. I'm just going to be phrasing back their own arguments. Some Muslims claim that one should reject all hadith because they're not as reliable as the Quran and adhere to the Quran alone. But there are issues with that approach as well. However, in the Quran itself, Muslims are ordered to follow the Prophet in approximately 100 verses. Right? There's numerous verses that tell them. And you've just seen from the Sharia, and the Sharia is the final interpretation of the Quran. And we've just seen that they are expected to follow the Prophet and, of course, the successes of the Prophet. It is not acceptable to say that we are ordered to follow the Prophet when they have no way of knowing how to follow him. As Thadia said, Muhammad's only mentioned in four verses. Jesus is mentioned in like 89. You know, so is the Quran about Jesus or is the Quran about Muhammad? Four verses 90, four verses 90. I don't know. I'm bad at maths, Thadia. So how about you? Yeah, a tough one to figure out there. I, I, I guess I'll just have to remain a mystery. <laughs> I guess so. So, of course, we don't know anything about Muhammad from the Quran. So where we find him is in the Hadith. And of course, in the Sirah, it is not acceptable to say that it was an obligation upon the companions to follow the Prophet, but not those that came after. So they're saying, no, look, 
Anyway, these are the, the arguments, these are the points. Though the word hadith can refer to the sayings and actions of a companion of Muhammad, generally it is used in the context of what is attributed to Muhammad. These are his sayings, actions, attributes, approvals, also his disapprovals, and both implicit and explicit, things that he didn't do, things that he didn't allow, things that were not done. So it's not just what he did and didn't do, it's also what's implicit. So those also count. And hadith now generally consists of two parts. We have the sanad, the plural isnad, which is the chain. This is the names of people. So the isnad or the sanad is the names of people. These are the narrators who told the hadith. And yet the matan, the text of what was reportedly said or what reportedly happened, hold these apart in your mind. These are two separate elements that they will work with. Um, any questions before I'll pause here? Uh, we do have a, a comment from D Diane. Every time I hear scholars talk about the Quran and Hadith, I think of Shakespeare's, oh, what a tangled web we weave when first we practice to deceive. And as we're going to see, the criteria they use to evaluate the so-called reliability of them are designed to allow them to reach the conclusions they want to reach, not an actual inquiry into what is true and not. Yeah, Cheka Kurian asked a good question, how they deal with situations where Muslims disagree. Yeah, let's leave that for the end. But generally speaking, they do agree. You can understand that you can recognize a Muslim. You, you don't look at them and go, oh, those are Mormons. You know, you don't make that mistake. Clearly, they agree on enough. So the fact that some Hadith narrations are unreliable does not mean that all narrations are unreliable. Scholars of Hadith apparently analyze the Sanad and the Matan of Hadith to determine reliability. For example, if one of this, these are their arguments, right? Not mine. For example, for example, if one of the narrators in the chain was known to be a liar, or if there were contradictory statements in the Matan, the text of a particular narration, the scholars would know this narration is unreliable. Now, understand that Islam is the religion of word of mouth. Word of mouth literally underpins Islam because the Quran wasn't definitive enough. It, that they are very insecure about the Quran, in fact. So Imam Abdullah ibn Mubarak said, the Isnad is a part of our religion. So the chain of transmission is a part of our transmission. Without the Sanad, anyone could say whatever he wished. Imam Muhammad ibn Sirin said, this knowledge is religion. So the Sanad is religion. So look thoroughly into the one from whom you take your religion. And Imam Muslim says this, repeats this quote in the introduction to his Asahi. Your comments on that, that is? Yeah, I mean, well, in, in principle, the, the criteria that they, they've laid out sound reasonable, but the problem is going to be that all you really have is the one person who wrote it down. You know, you you have Imam Muslim or Imam Bukhari, and that's really all we actually have as evidence. And of course, they came 200 plus years after Muhammad. The, the chain adds nothing. All you really have is the witness of Bukhari, that he right. determined this was reliable, and that's it. We, also, we have no access to all the people who supposedly narrated it. They didn't leave any writings behind. Yeah, I miss this call super. Now, what's interesting is we'll get to this in the end, but Bukhari provided no hint as to what criteria he used. So the scholars don't know. They've had to guess. They've had to infer. So now, a lot of chain of narration, they claim that you cannot, you cannot defend yourself when challenged, but you can have. So this chain is proof of authenticity of this story. So this story in the Adith, this is proof because we know who said it for 200 years. Like, sure you do. So summary, the Sanad preserves and protects Islam. This is one of their, this is their doctrine. Sanad protects and preserves Islam. Now they function as references. Give me a reference to prove this. Well, yeah, it was said by John who heard it from James, who heard it from Jill who heard it from Anne who heard it from from Clive who heard it from from Mark who heard it from what yeah 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 that sounds legit that that sounds <laughs> legit what if the story was bogus to begin with sure they accurately transmitted the story but it's a bogus story yeah exactly the and, and uh, you know if you're just talking to a friend and they said they heard it from someone you'd probably say okay 
I, I, I know who it's from, but if they said they heard it from someone who heard it from someone else, just that far even, you'd probably be like, oh, yeah, I'm not going to really believe this story. It's too far removed from the original already. And, you know, with the, the Hadith, you're talking about doing that eight more times. <laughs> exactly. Now, understand, they say that having a chain means you're not following blindly, nor are you leading others astray. If you have a chain, you are relying on authority. So think, this is why Muslims constantly refer to a, consult a scholar, refer to what, that's why they respect authority, because their authorities respect the authority before them, we respect the authority before them, and someone up the chain, because it comes from Muhammad, then to his companions, then to someone they told, who told someone else, who told someone else, who told someone else, who told someone else, who told someone else. And they're just carrying this torch. And, and that's, their, that's their idea of a reference, is the authority of the person who said it before they knew it. So now, broken telephone literally is, the telephone game, is how hadiths are transmitted. So in addition to the reliability of the... In, Thaddeus, um, this Imam al-Jabbar, who was the 18th in the chain of transmission <laughs> for that hadith, was he a nice guy? He I guess. Yeah, yeah. I, I heard that he's very reliable. But let, let me check the content of the, the hadith to, to make sure that I want to make him reliable. Because if okay, I don't like yeah. the content of this hadith, I can just say he's not reliable. And then well, I, I get already he helped little old ladies across <laughs> the street. So that makes this hadith sahih. <laughs> oh, okay. I, I'll take your word for it. I mean, word of mouth is always better than actual evidence, right? And this quite literally is how hadith are graded. I'm not kidding. I wish I were kidding, but this is quite literally how it's done. So... Scholars also look at the number of routes of transmission for a particular narration. So you told it, you, you know, you, you, 10 people saw it and they went off 10 people and they told a bunch of people. So you got 10 chains, right? Hadith are classified based on routes of transmission. You have mutawatir, which means uninterrupted. You have multiple chains of narration. You have mashhur and you have ahad, which has a relatively small number of transmitters. So in summary, the more chains of transmission, the greater reliability of being true you have. And there are multiple other intermediary types like Mustafid, which I hadn't heard of until I started looking into this. Now, let's start looking at Mutawatir before we drag, get, out, get involved in the rest. Mutawatir, uninterrupted, multiple chain, multiple evidence hadiths. Now, Mutawatir hadiths, you must understand these things are powerful in Islam. These things are, man, the, the weight they carry. There are certain assumptions attached to them. There are so many transmitters that there could be no collusion. Now, the question is, why would they have to say, well, there could be no collusion? Why would they have to, you know, methinks that does protest too much already. Two, that all the transmitters are known to be reliable. Because, as you know, records were so detailed back in 7th century Arabia. The transmitters are not under compulsion to lie. These are the... These are the assumptions that are carried with mutawatir there could be no collusion it's 100 percent reliability and there is no compulsion to lie and here is the ruling this is the doctrine the official islamic doctrine on a mutawatir narration mutawatir narration necessitates certain knowledge that compels a muslim to believe with a necessary belief as if they had witnessed the event themselves they need to believe what they are told as if they were there and witnessed it themselves. That is their level of how much they must believe this. For this reason, Mutawatir narrations, all of them are accepted. Makbul. I'll pause there. Yeah, well, you know, the, again, these are principles that uh, make sense on the surface level, but when you really dig into them, they, they don't actually add anything, you know. It sounds good that there there are many transmitters because that in theory means there's many independent sources, but then you realize that all of these in, quote unquote independent sources were in fact collected by one man. So again, we're back to the reliability of one oh, man. <laughs> That's insanity. Yeah. So let me just see if I had some notes here. Okay. No, I don't. So there's multiple books. I have references for that slide if people want them afterwards. A Mutawatir Hadith is narrated from Muhammad by a large group of companions who witnessed the event. They then told it to a large group of people who told it to a large group, who then told it to another large group, and so on until today. That is how Mutawatir is read from Muhammad to a bunch of people who knew him to, you know, blah, blah, blah. So by this reasoning, then this number of people would not make a mistake with what they narrated, nor would they collaborate to lie about it or not be able to 
collaborate, to rely about, to lie about it. So now let's give you an example of a mutawatir hadith. Bukhari, volume five, book 59, hadith 473. The water miracle of the prophet in al Hudabiya near Mecca. And remember, this hadith is rock solid fact. It is not conjecture. It is 100% true. There is no denying it. Narrated Salim, Jabir said, on the day of al Hudabiya, the people felt thirsty and Allah's messenger had a utensil. He had like a cup or a small bowl. He performed ablution from it. The typo was in the original. And then the people came towards him. Allah's apostle said, what is wrong with you? The people said, oh, Allah's messenger, we haven't got water to perform ablution with or to drink except what you have in your cup or bowl. So the prophet put his hand in the utensil and the water started spouting out between his fingers like springs. So we drank and we performed ablution. In some narrations, this cup is too small for him to spread his hands. He has to put his fingers together to put it in the cup. I said to Jabir, what was your number on that day? He replied, even if we had been 100,000, that water would have been sufficient for us. Anyhow, we were 1,500. 1,500 people basically took a shower from a cup. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that, that sounds pretty miraculous, but um, you said this was completely reliable. But I have a problem because the, the Quran says that Muhammad never worked any miracles. So are you telling me that the Quran is not reliable? Are you calling Allah a liar? <laughs> <laughs> Dude, so, so yeah, understand the scholars, the Hadith basically trample all over the Quran. I've been saying this for a while. I mean, I've, I've been blunt about it. I've been saying it for a while and I'm trying to say it nicely now. So it sounds more scholarly, but you know, but yeah, hopefully that will start to become clear. So let's look at this Mutawatir Hadith, the water miracle of the Prophet. Now, the grade of Mutawatir means that this Hadith is definitively confirmed. There is no doubt. It cannot be false. It cannot be a lie. And it cannot be incorrect. I'll leave you. Please post your comments. What, what do you think? What do you guys think? Yeah, I mean, this is pretty crazy. Of course, this is the most reliable possible grade, and yet it contradicts the Quran. I guess that Allah decided to abrogate that part of the Quran where he said that he would never give Muhammad a sign because people wouldn't believe it anyway. I guess he changed his mind. Yeah, yeah, no. So moving on. Now, this is repeated multiple times that I found. Okay, these are eight more occasions. Now, for instance, the, so I'll read this one. So you've got Bukhari, volume one, book four, hadith 199, 769, 543, 456, 772. I've got three more here. Plus I've got Sahih Muslim, book 30, hadith 5656. I'll read a random one that I grabbed. Um, I was actually trying to grab a different one, but I closed the tab by accident. So I took the next one. Narrated Anas, a bowl of water was brought to the prophet while he was at Azara. He placed his hand in it and the water started flowing among his fingers. All the people performed ablution with that water. Katada asked Anas, how many people were you? Anas replied, 300 or nearly 300. Now we have eight more either repetitions of the same event or eight more occasions of the same kind of event. So wait a second here. The, this hadith, which is 100% completely reliable, unquestionable, says there was 300 people. But the first one you, you read me said there was 1500 people that's a pretty substantial difference there if if, if this was if these were two gospel accounts that would be false. proof that the, the bible's corrupt would it not yet somehow this is islam i've got you <laughs> this is Thaddeus, i'm sorry this is islam this is islam you i'm gonna have to school you on this <laughs> Because they're going to put you to right pretty soon. They're going to explain that you just don't understand that is. All right. I'll, I'll wait and see. <laughs> so, yeah. So either we've got this happening eight more times or we've got the same event described in eight different ways. Right. So let's move on. So now this term Tawatu means well attested. Okay. This is a very important term. This describes, this is two categorizations of Mutawatu Hadith. So they've got two categories. Look, there's probably a billion of them. If you read through it, holy moly. But I'm, I'm trying to, I'm hoping we finish in under three weeks. So I'm just trying to <laughs> summarize everything here. Tawatir lafzi, in the science of tradition, the verbatim or near verbatim, mutawatir transmission of a text. In their thinking, fraud is unthinkable. It's impossible. Now, tawatir lafzi is distinguished from tawatir manawi. 
transmission according to the gist or salient feature, one salient feature, one important specific outstanding feature of a given text. To water Manawi, outnumber verbatim, lafzi hadith. Narrators do not necessarily have to be trustworthy, upright, adil, as they say, nor do they have to be Muslims. And they say that even a liar may occasionally speak the truth. Conversely, a trustworthy person may lie, repeat a lie unknowingly, or he may be mistaken. Fine. Now, for example, can we confirm that Japan exists even if we've never been to Japan? Well, yes, we can, because uh, you heard someone say, you know, I went to Japan on holiday and they told you about their holiday, what they ate. Another person went there on holiday and they went up Mount Fuji and they tell you about Mount Fuji. Another person went on business. Another person got sick and tells you about the hospital. What is consistent is Japan. What is inconsistent is the description. So even though the descriptions are completely varied, you can confirm that Japan exists, right? So that, that is, and that's Tawatur Man'awi. You've got consistency of a salient feature. You don't have verbatim repetition of the same phrase, right? Now, <clears throat> news conveyed in a mutawatir manner is known with certainty and cannot be wrong. Their words, not mine. It is in this way that some of the miracles of the prophet were conveyed to Muslims today, and thus hadith are considered a definitive proof for his prophethood. I thought the Quran was enough, but apparently not. So again, there are two types of mutawatir, man'awi and lafz. Right, so tawatir referring to the meaning of a narration only, which is man'awi, right, or to both its meaning and its words, that's lafzi. The wording of some hadith may not be, no. so the wording of some hadith may not be mutawatir, even though the meaning is mutawatir. Right, does that make sense so far, Thaddeus? I'll pause there. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'll, I'll let you finish before I compare this okay. to the Gospels, but I mean, these are, are actually quite reasonable criteria. The problem is that Muslims don't actually apply them. <laughs> so in these cases, there is a meaning that is common between different narrations. The different narrations support each other. So the multiplicity of these different chains of transmission support each other. And therefore, we can confirm Japan exists. Therefore, we can confirm Muhammad had liters and liters of water coming out of his fingers. So the existence of Japan is mutawatir. It is mutawatir manawi. So each person describes and gives evidence in a different way, be it holiday, business, family, whether got sick, etc. Commonality is Japan. I'll pause there then. Yeah. So, you know, the, this idea that different details can still, you know, you can tell two versions of a story and have different details and they both be re reliable is a perfectly reasonable conclusion to reach. Unfortunately, when Muslims look at the Bible, somehow they don't understand that. When they look at the Hadith, they understand it. When they look at the Bible and they, they see that one resurrection account has two angels at the tomb and one just says an angel, they're like, oh, that, that's a contradiction. You can't have two angels and one angel at the same time. It, they, yeah. This, this can is... you have 300 people and 1,500 people at the same time? Right. And, and of course, it, it's much more natural just to say there is an angel there and not when you meet when there was many than then to say there was 300 when there was actually 1500. So it, different details can actually show that there are multiple different sources. Now, in the case of the Hadith, we, a careful investigation would show that's not really the case, that they, they obviously derive from one another and people just misremembered uh, details. But when you have uh, differing details, that at least gives you the opportunity to investigate the reliability of something. Yeah, so understand, they don't apply their own criteria to the Bible, but we'll, we'll get to how they throw the Bible under the bus. So basically, so then, so just to repeat, I'm, I'm repeating some of this. I'm trying to really get this through our heads because this refers to the Bible and this is important. So this lafzi thing, it means the words are either identical, almost identical, what they call mutakarib. Now, they may have used that word wrong or whatever, so, for example, if a narration said the one who does such and such will be punished, but another hadith says if someone does such and such, they deserve to be punished. Well, these are close enough. These are almost verbatim. So, therefore, they are mutawatir in terms of the words. That's mutawatir lafzi. It's close enough. Both types of mutawatir, whether by meaning or by words, result in quality, definitive information that is absolutely confirmed with certainty and cannot be a lie. Some scholars say that mutawatir requires a minimum of number of 25 people that transmitted, right? 25 chains. 
Others say 10. Others say 12. Others say, well, it depends who's transmitting. It could be one guy. Pick a name. Hmm. You know, others say, well, it depends. Is it an important matter? Not an important matter. If it's not so important, well, then, you know, yeah, we can let the standard slide. So in other words, it's whatever they feel like on the day. Yes, they, they, they set this up as a science, but in fact, it's just a, a game. Um, Tatuanin said earlier that um, Hadiths Muslims like are reliable, embarrassing ones are not. This is science. And, and of course, that's ultimately what it comes down to. Fortunately for us, the criteria were established in, you know, long ago in like the, the 10th through 14th centuries when a lot of the stuff that's found embarrassing today wasn't embarrassing. So they ended right. up grading those sahi. But if they were doing them today, no doubt they would just change the criteria to get whichever hadith they wanted to be true, to be true and throw out the rest. Correct, I agree there. So, so now what's important and how this refers to Christianity, the Bible, to the stories of Jesus, this is how it impacts us and how they are misleading us. And they don't explain to us that they're using their criteria against us and don't explain their terms and they use the word corrupted instead without explaining all this garbage I've been talking to you about. So now the scholars assert that Mutawatir proves Muhammad's prophethood beyond a shadow of a doubt with 100% certainty that what Mo taught is the truth. A narration that is from one person to a large group is not Mutawatir. That is why the Christian claim, they say, about prophet Isa, and I'm using Isa because this is not Jesus, being killed is not Mutawatir. In other words, Jesus was never crucified, it is not Mutawatir. And they, they throw Paul under the bus here as much as they can, right? They go after him. So they say that basically every single one, but Paul is the one they chose in this example. It's one guy, one guy, one witness. Now, whether 50 people were there, 100 people saw it, but they told Paul. Paul wrote it down, he's one guy. And whether his book was read by 100, then by then copied and spread to a thousand and then to a million, doesn't matter. One guy, not Mutawatir, one is too little, right? So their broken telephone system is apparently way better. So the gospels are not Mutawatir, despite the existence of copies of written text, they don't care. None, they say, has a single chain going back to the person who wrote it. And furthermore, none of those has a chain from the author to Jesus right, to confirm what he's claimed, because they've got, they've got Allah to Mo, no, Allah to Jibreel, Jibreel to Mo, Mo to a bunch of people. But in that case, one doesn't matter. Yeah, I mean, this is just so crazy, because it's like, here's the, the it's not for the gospel of Matthew, Matthew. Oh, well, that, that's not reliable. There's no chain going back to Matthew. He can't write it down himself. You got to pass it through six generations orally, then write it down. Then it's reliable. And Matthew doesn't have 12 chains going back to Jesus directly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he just wrote about what he, what he saw himself. I mean, that can't possibly be reliable. We need, we need to pass it around the, the gossip circle for a couple hundred years. Then we know, can know it's reliable. Exactly. This is quite literally, this is quite honestly, these are their criteria for assessing reliability. And this is why they reject the Bible. Right. So they say that, that Paul didn't know Jesus firsthand. So therefore it's not much water. It's, they don't exactly explicitly say what grade they assign, but the thing is, it's probably matric, which is rejected or it is maudu, fabricated, false. Now here's the thing. If the Bible and the gospels are false, are fabricated, how are they in the very next breath going, but your Bible proves Muhammad? Yeah, you know, that one, that one, I, I just cannot figure out how anyone could, uh, and one mouth say, your Bible's unreliable, it contains false information. By the way, your Bible proves that Muhammad's a prophet. What I thought it was false. So if it says Muhammad's a prophet, does that mean he's not a prophet? I, I don't know. I, yeah, so this is crazy. exactly this is insane so think about it they've never explained their criteria to us but by their criteria the bible is effectively fabricated right fabricated completely unreliable and they'll turn around and say because we don't know this but if we can start to talk to them and say hold on but according to your own standard look, they'll lie anyway they'll lie about everything but that's fine you know we can start to throw a span in their works because now we understand their criteria so likewise they claim the torah of the jews is not mutawatir so the first five books of the Bible are apparently just unreliable, completely unreliable, made up by one guy, 
Do they name the guy? No, they don't. So if the numbers in the chain falls below the minimum requirement, the chain is no longer Mutawatir. You could have 20 people, which is great. Then you've got two, then you've got two. Matthew's only one guy. Mark's only one guy. Luke's one guy. Mm, less than even two. Bugger that. Not Mutawatir. Sorry, sorry. Nice try. Throw it out of here. Right now, the biblical gospels have no single chain of narration back to Luke or Matthew, and then from then to Jesus, whatever they'll say, right? They say it is presumed by Christians that those people wrote it with no chain of narration going back to Isa like they have back to Muhammad. Right? So Christians say that Isa spoke Aramaic and Hebrew. I fixed that typo. They accept that he spoke no Greek. They claim, now this is what they tell their Muslims in their dawah, in their mosques. This is what they teach their Muslims, right? That we accept that Jesus spoke no Greek whatsoever. So we do not have his actual words. But I want to make one point before I let Thaddeus speak here. In John 19, 19 to 20, and Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross. And the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. In John 19, 20, it goes, this title then read many this title then read many of the Jews for the place where Jesus was crucified was known to the city and it was written in Hebrew and Greek and Latin. If nobody spoke Greek, why are they making signs in Greek? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, you know this this I well first of all this is a flat out lie because. Um, I'm a Christian. I do not accept that Jesus spoke no Greek. They're, they're just claiming that we accept that. Um, of course, there are people who will say that Jesus didn't speak Greek, but they have no way of knowing that. And in the scholarly circles, you know, it, it's a it's a topic that there there's some debate about. But there's good solid evidence that the vast majority of people who lived in that region at that time did in fact speak Greek. For example. Uh, Jewish tombs, which you think would only be written in Hebrew, often were written in Hebrew and Greek. Uh, the only reason you would write it in Greek is if you wanted people to actually be able to understand it. There would be no religious purpose or anything like that to, to write it in Greek, but the people's names were written in both Hebrew and Greek. Um, in the gospel accounts, Jesus himself speaks directly to a Roman uh, centurion. If it, it, it's not all that likely that the centurion and the would... centurion spoke either either Latin or Greek. Yeah, I was going to say it's not very likely that he would have learned Aramaic. He probably was speaking either Latin or Greek. Um, well, he probably would know both those languages, and yeah. Greek was the the universal language that everyone learned. It's kind of like English today. Um, you know, I, I'm from the United States, so English is my first language. But a lot of people around the world know English, and it's not their first language. I, I would say that the majority of the world's population speaks English in addition to another language. This is kind of saying that Jesus couldn't have spoken Greek is just a historical fallacy that you, you project current American norms back onto the first century when in fact at that time and throughout most of world history, it was common for people to speak multiple languages. Correct. Correct. Yeah. So these are their arguments, and their arguments are flimsy, as you can tell, it's paper thin. So often, now they say often not a single chain of narration of trustworthy people with good memories goes back to Isa. Now look, David Wood has covered this, and other channels have covered this. Muslims have terrible memories. Their own sources show us they've had horrible memories. And now they're saying good memories go, well, whatever. Yeah, sure, right, whatever. So now they claim the Torah was lost. They say that Jews say that copies of the Torah were all burned and only one man had memorized it. I have no idea if this is true. That's just what the guys were saying. So what the heck? Okay, fine. That's what the lecture was saying. Fine. Okay, great. Whatever. And they say that this guy dictated it from memory. And therefore, this chain is not meant to water. Therefore, we no longer have the original Torah in our possession today. We have the faulty memory of this one dude who gave us the Torah and therefore, we have no idea what the original Torah said. We've got this guy's word for it. It's not Mutawatir, therefore the Bible is corrupt. Does that make that case clear? How come they say the Bible is corrupt? Yeah, yeah totally crazy stuff. You know, the, the person who 
gave you the these facts. It says that the Jews say that copies of the Torah were burned and only one man had it memorized. You know, I've spoken to many Jews in my lifetime. I've never heard one Jew make that claim. And, I, you know, honestly, I don't even know what he might be mistakenly alluding to. Uh, I think, as near as I can tell, he just totally made that up and attributed it to Jews. Right. Exactly. Exactly. But they know the Muslims are not going to look this up. They absolutely know. They can rely on these people simply just falling in line and going, yep. So now this is the claim for the superiority of the Quran. The, they say the Quran is numerous with the water chains going back to the prophet. And by this, they are 100% certain that the Quran today is the same exact Quran recited by Mo, heard by the companions, except we know there are at least 37 different Arabic Qurans. So maybe Yahya can give us an answer to that because uh, this is a guy that, that he rejects all of Islam, all Islamic doctrine, and he claims he's defending Islam. Like, huh? Okay, whatever. So now let's go to Mashur Hadith. So we have about 18 slides left. And should I go faster, Thaddeus? No, you're fine. I, I'm in no hurry if you aren't. Okay. So literally, this is the famous Hadith. And technically, it's actually well-known. The you know, they say famous, whatever, fine, well-known hadith, mashur, narrated from the prophet by at least three companions, then narrated by at least three more of the followers of the companions, then by at least three of the followers of the followers, and so on from the beginning of the chain till its end. So mashur is a well-known tradition transmitted by a minimum of three different isnads, three different chains, three different narrators in the chain. All right. These references here are to the Encyclopedia of Islam, the volume 3, 25B, right side column. Volume 6, 717A, left side column, right, if you want to find out more. So in law, a mashur, mashur means the predominant opinion, a strong opinion. In other words, we would call this not sahih, but this would be, uh, oh gosh, what's the other word? I keep forgetting that is. Hassan. I did Hassan, yes, thank you. I have a problem. I keep forgetting that one. So yeah, this would effectively would be Hassan as opposed to the isolated or anomalous opinion. So it is suitable for use in making legal judgments. So the the... the so the ulama can use this to make legal judgments, judging something haram, saying, nope, that's bad, so that it is lawful to use it. Ahad hadith, the majority of hadith are ahad. So in a, ahad in the science of the tradition are from a relatively small number of transmitters, one to two, not enough to make them mutawatir, but notice, not enough to make them rejected. Isn't that fascinating? Isn't that a bit of a double standard right there? Uh -huh. <laughs> so... In at least one point in the chain, it is narrated by less than three people. What they mean is one or two. Now, the Gospels are bad because one or two. But in Islam, oh, yeah, legit. Yeah, legit. <laughs> so you have two types. <laughs> you have Aziz, which is strong. Aziz, because it's got two narrators. Strong. Right? And Harib, which is rare because it's got one. Not <laughs> false. Rare. Okay? So it is not used for judging what is fad or what is haram, or matters of belief. Now, haram, obviously, we know that's illegal, right? Remember, Islam doesn't have a moral system like Christianity does. They don't believe in right and wrong. They believe in legal and illegal. Like, it is legal to marry a nine-year-old and, you know, blah, blah, blah. That's legal, not immoral. It's not immoral. They don't care. There's, they don't have those standards in Islam, right? But fad means this is obligatory. What is obligatory to do in the religion? There's two kinds of obligation. Fad kifaya, fad al -ain. Fad al -ain means personal obligation or universal obligation, like saying the five daily prayers. That's something you must do. Every Muslim is responsible for that. But fad kifaya means a universal, sorry, a communal obligation like jihad. A small minority must do this or the sin of non-compliance will fall on the entire Islamic community. Right. And please ask this idiot by the name of Islam Defender Yahya to please provide us Sharia citations, citations from the fiqh. I want to see scholarly works, your opinion. Remember, it does say in Islam that he who recites from his own opinion is in error. That's the word of Muhammad. I believe you respect that guy. Not sure if you do exactly, but apparently. So I don't want to hear your opinion. Show me the scholarly works, because if you don't follow your scholars, then you're just making your own religion up. You're just making up your own thing. So if a hadith is a had, but all the scholars are... Now, here's the thing. Now, here's the kicker. If the hadith is ha, a had, but all the scholars are unanimous that it's authentic, then suddenly it goes from unreliable, becomes sahih. Yeah. Well, you know, the, the majority of the, the scholars can't be wrong, right? They're in, infallible. So who needs a reliable? It's not Jane after yeah, all. 
this looks legit to me, Thaddeus. I mean, it says here that, you know, it says here, it looks legit. What do you say? Yeah, I, I agree. So we got a complete consensus. This is Asahi Hadith now. Yeah, it says the guy who said it, he walked a little old lady across the road. That good character. You know, that's an important criteria that we use when judging these things, you know. Walked a lady across the road twice. Carried her shopping home once. She was 65 and she had broke bad hands. Arthritis. Good man. It's Sahi. <laughs> I wish I were kidding, but that's actually how it works. <laughs> so, yeah, let's. Yeah. So now we've got a few others. So, yeah, we have Mustafa, Maudu, Matruk, Matruk, and a bunch of others, right? There's tons of them. Mustafa, an intermediate class between the Ahad and Mashur. Enough said. Maudu, fictitious, the worst type of hadith. Matra, rejected in hadith, a tradition from a single transmitter suspected of falsehood, openly wicked in word or deed, or guilty of carelessness or frequent wrong notions. Bad character. For instance, let me, so I'll give you an example of a matruk. I hope, I hope Yahya is listening. You can, I will stick around to learn. You're going to learn something now. And I don't want you to start, you know, I want you to start being honest. Islam's religion of truth. So the age of Khadija, Muhammad's first wife, is commonly reported as 40. This is rejected. This is quite literally considered matruk. The chain of narration in that is considered matruk, rejected in hadith. That is the official formal scholarly opinion on that. It is completely false. Her age range goes from anything from 25 to 46. The accepted age in general is 25. The reason is she gave Muhammad six children. How does a sixth or seventh century woman have children when she's 50? We can barely do that today. So the fact is, unless it was a miracle, of course, they'll just say, ah, it was a miracle. Okay, whatever. But the fact is that they say, no, it's matruk. It is rejected. There are numerous, numerous narrations about Muhammad that are considered matruk. But yet they've become famous. They've become common. They've become the accepted narrative, even though they are considered to be a lie. Your thoughts, that is? Yeah, you know, it's very interesting that, you know, we, we went through all these rules, but what we're really seeing in the end is it's just the opinion of the scholars. That's all that really matters. Yeah, and if they like something, it's like, ah, it's legit, whatever. Yep. Um, Tatiana did say that your volume is slightly lower than mine. I should have asked that at the beginning. I, I forgot to say something. I'm using a different microphone setup than I usually do. So I should have said, ask people if the volumes were okay. Um, yeah, let me just adjust. Uh, okay. I'm just going into my settings. Yeah, my levels are low. She's right. My levels dropped for some reason. All right. Hopefully that will fix that. Okay. If not, you can. Yeah, the, yeah. If my levels are low. She's right. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You're a lot louder now, even for me. So. Yeah, I pushed my levels up to 60. I'm sorry about that. I know I don't know what happened. Um, they should have been, but okay, yeah. So so just keep monitoring that. Let me know if my levels drop. So um matruk rejected in hadith. Matruk, another type of rejected hadith, right? Now these traditions are not just in hadith. These tra these traditions are in lots of stories, they're also in the Sira and so on. It's said by some now, now matruk sometimes is regarded as equivalent to matruk, and different spellings applied. You'll find multiple different types of spellings. And also, in, others call it a separate class of traditions, less acceptable than Da'if, but not as bad as Maudu. Da'if is weak. Da'if is still legal. Da'if is highly legal. It is considered reliable. A Da'if hadith is considered absolutely, totally reliable. Okay? But it's not as bad as something that's fictitious. And we have Mardud, rejected, that which is concluded to be reported by an unreliable or untruthful narrator. Its ruling is such that this narration cannot be used as a proof and is not acted upon. So they've got these little subtleties, these nuances between them that, that differentiate between. And that's the last I'm going to say about these things. I'll move on here. Yeah, I think that that's more than enough details on the classification. Uh, the takeaway point is that the scholars are the ones that are really decide, really, I shouldn't say are deciding, have decided in the past which Hadith are reliable and which are not. And the modern scholars, they don't even have the, the right to decide that anymore. It's already been decided for them. And of right. course, the common Muslim is it within a million miles of being able to decide what's reliable and what isn't. So you can either accept 
the opinions of the scholars and be a member of Orthodox Islam, or you can reject them and then be in a heretical sect of one. But uh, we, we would like to address Islam. So if people want to reject Hadith, that's their own business, but they're not Muslims anymore if they do. Right. So a chain is only as strong as whatever. So when looked at individually, now, now for instance, they say that, that's a weak hadith, oh, that's rejected, no. When looked at individually, a chain may be considered weak. But remember I said the chain is completely different to the text, right? So a narrator can be trustworthy, but he might have a weak memory. But if there are other chains on the same thing, like two or three other chains, then these chains corroborate each other and it increases the reliability of the narration. So in other words, it, it gets rid of, you can ignore that guy because, you know, it's replaced by someone else. So the chain is now a separate entity to the text. And a weak hadith, now notice, a weak hadith, well, these Muslims that lie to us all the time, has a weak chain. The word weak only refers to the chain. It has nothing to do with the text of the hadith, right? So a weak hadith has a weak chain, not weak text. Understand that point. And a weak chain, a single weak chain, can be offset if there's two or three other chains that are accepted. And you can ignore that one then it's no longer weak. They can say that's a weak chain. Yes, it has a weak chain, but it has five totally solid chains. And that's how they fool us. Understand that. They will lie to us like that. Now, we you may have heard of this guy. Really, really popular. We all love him. And this show is dedicated to Sheikh Yasser Qadi. <laughs> I think we all owe him a lot of things. I hope you guys have sent him like flowers or cards or chocolates or something. Because, man, we, we owe this man a lot. <laughs> Poor guy. So understand that hadith abrogate hadith. Just like the Quran abrogates the Quran, verses in the Quran, newer ones abrogate older ones. By the same token, newer hadith abrogate older hadith. But I need to understand hadith also abrogate the Quran. And here's a question. Does any of you have a list of the non-abrogated verses in the Quran? Do you? No, you don't. They've never given it to you. No scholars give. They don't want you to know. So understand, so you've got old verses abrogated by newer verses. So you've got a collection of the newer verses. Yes, that you probably do. But you don't know which of those verses were abrogated by the Hadith, do you? No, you don't. Yeah. They, never, they never told you. So you don't know which of these non-abrogated verses were abrogated by the Hadith. And you don't know which of those Hadith were abrogated by other Hadith, do you? No, you don't. That's the scholars know. That's their little secret. And that's how they lie to us and fool us. So this is an introduction yep. to the sciences. But before you go to the, yep. the material from Kadi, there's a couple of comments from the chat I wanted to address. Um, first from Wooter, a uh, super chat. So thank you very much for that. Hill slide, uh, that's fair. Yeah, yeah, Hill slide said, uh, this is really helpful stream because the common Muslims abuse the classification so much. Uh, they play with the class like M Momo played with Aisha. It's ridiculous. Uh, you know, th thank you for the feedback like that. Uh, it's really hard for us to tell um, which presentations are, are more helpful. So uh, feedback by that really helps us a lot. And uh, the reference to Aisha, it was great there. And then lastly from NN was, the Quran is an opaque revelation. So without Al-Hadith to explain this literary disaster, uh, the AKA the Quran, it would have no meaning. And you know, that, that's one of the things we've been hitting on these shows lately is that we have this idea as Christians that the Quran is just like the Bible, that, that Muslims go to the Quran and they get their doctrine by exegeting the text of, of the Quran, like we exegete the text of the Bible. And that's the totally wrong perspective to have. And Muslims want us to have that perspective because as long as we're playing the what does the Quran mean game? Well, they can say it means anything because the text is quite unclear despite its internal claims. But mm -hmm. the scholarly interpretation of it is definitive. It's, the common Muslim is not allowed to interpret the Quran for themselves. They have to listen to their teachers, hear what they say, memorize it, regurgitate it, and obey. And that's the extent of learning in Islam. Yeah. So yeah, so what I explained to you is serious. This is real. Verses in the Quran abrogate verses in the Quran. And then the, that, those verses are then subsequently later abrogated by Hadith. And then those Hadith are abrogated by Hadith. Because as the understanding or the desire changed, they altered all these things. So you don't know. You don't have that list. 
I don't have that list. What I do have is the, the scholarly text and the Sharia and the Fiqh. These are where their final interpretations, their final opinions all coalesce. That's what we can find. Yahya is here to cause confusion. Like all of these, Quran is never like the Bible. Yeah, exactly. The Quran makes no sense. Quran was written by aliens, ancient aliens, dude. Well, you, you know, he actually just agreed with me. I said we mistakenly treat the Quran like it's the Bible. Um, <laughs> exactly. You, you treat the Bible quite, or the Quran quite differently than we treat the Bible. We treat the, the Bible as the final authority, and you treat your scholars as the final authority. Yeah. So, yeah. So, now what I'll do is I'm just going to be very brief about this, but Allah has the right to abrogate any command that originated from Him either in the Quran or through the tongue of his prophet. Now, where do we find the words of Muhammad? Hmm. Can you tell me, Thaddeus? Um, I, I think it's the Quran, right? Isn't that the eternal word of Muhammad? <laughs> oh, man, now I'm confused. Can, can, the, can the, that section? No, it's, it, I think it's the Hadith. Is that, we, we, yeah, so in other words, anything Muhammad say can abrogate anything Allah said. Okay. And this is from this PhD. Um, Yahya, can you give us a link to your PhD certificate in the in the chat so we can look <laughs> it up, please? Can you just drop a link so we can check your PhD? So this this PhD in Islam here, in Islamic studies, one of the most famous Islamic scholars in the world, he tells us this, right? Moving on. So he says there are four logical scenarios considering what they call Nasik and Mansik or Nasik. Nasik is the abrogating and Mansik is the abrogated. Now, don't forget, when any mom studies Islam, when any mom goes to do his five or seven year course on Islam, he has to learn. One of his obligations is he studies the Nasik and the Mansik. He has to study abrogation to know what is abrogated, to know what is what it's replaced by, right? So he says the four scenarios of abrogation are the Quran abrogating the Quran, the Quran abrogating the Sunnah, the Sunnah abrogating the Quran. I think that's pretty clear there. The Sunnah abrogating the Quran. And he goes on to say, a mutawatir hadith abrogating the Quran. I think that's pretty clear. Mm -hmm. And then he says the Sunnah abrogating the Sunnah. So in other words, the Quran can cancel something that came before in the Quran. And then, of course, the Sunnah can then abrogate the Quran. And then a mutawatir hadith can then also abrogate the Quran. And then the hadith can then abrogate the hadith to make a change. Um, but of course, Yaka is going to tell us that he's not a real Muslim. You know? <laughs> we, yeah, yeah, you know, they'll, they'll throw anyone under the bus in the in the YouTube comment section. Um, the other day, the the Muslims in the comments were telling you that the so called most reliable Muslim scholar in history wasn't actually a Muslim; that he was just a pretender or whatever. But uh, we, we did a show a while ago on abrogation. So I would definitely say to check that out as well. But the, yeah. the takeaway here is that anything can abrogate anything. Basically, abrogation is just an excuse to remove anything contradictory. And the scholars determine which one is correct. And yeah. Not Allah. Right. So yeah. So now the scholars tell us straight up, abrogation fixed Muhammad's mistakes. The scholars will flat out tell you Muhammad made mistakes and Allah had to abrogate to fix the stupid mistakes that Muhammad had because of his bad memory or his misapplication of doctrine. Okay. Now this is Imam Hamid al-Ghazali. This is the Maimonides of Islam. Just like Joseph Maimonides is the prime Jewish scholar of the Talmud and so on. This man is the prime scholar. He is the Maimonides of Islam. I want you guys to understand. They copied the Talmud. Really, this the, the Sharia is the is the Muslim Talmud. So Imam Ghazali is considered the most important Muslim scholar in history. He is the jo the Joseph Maimonides of Islam. He's unanimously accepted as a Hijri Muhat Mujadid or Centennial Renovator of Religion. The theory goes: every one hundred years, a, a great scholar will be born who will refresh the faith, who will inspire people and and renew the faith. His works were so highly acclaimed by his contemporaries that he's the only Muslim to be called Hujat al Islam meaning Islam's foremost authority, the proof of Islam, its decisive argument. These were titles given to him, the decisive argument of Islam. He proved Islam. He made the, this is the man that finally put the crowning cap on Islam. And he lived in what, 10th, 11th century. So that's that's like a week or two after Muhammad died, that, that is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, something like that. The, 
the 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 fifth century after the the Hajj is is the same as the five years after, right? <laughs> Dude, I'm I'm you know I'm I come from Africa, man. I had a terrible education. I, I struggle <laughs> with these things. Yeah. So anyway, this guy came like 500 years after Muhammad, right? So this man is serious. This man is solid. He's the finest scholar Islam ever produced. There are 28 what they call Sheikh al-Islam, okay, the top scholars of Islam, but this man is, sits above them. So he's a mujadid, renew of the faith, through come blah, blah, blah. And he refuted the philosophy of Ibn Sina. So in other words, Ghazali basically proved that Islamic ethics is superior to Aristotelian ethics, and it re he rejected Aristotelian ethics and logic. And he said that, that they are compatible. So Western ethics and logic are incompatible with Islamic ethics and reasoning. This is his claim to fame. Besides, he wrote the most famous Islamic book after the Quran, the Ikhya Ulum al-Din. This is the most famous Islamic text, the most read Islamic text after the Quran. Okay. <clears throat> so remember when I spoke of last week with that, the five different stages, like you, you have to revile people, then you have to beat them and then break things. And that comes out of his spiritual work. Okay. That idea from the Sharia comes out of his work. Now he says here, he wrote in his book, Deliverance from Error, the prophets and religious leaders referred men to exercise of personal judgment, despite their knowledge that men might make mistakes. And the apostle of Allah even said, I judge by external, but God undertakes to judge the hearts of men. This means that Allah, basically Muhammad said, the prophets had no way to be safe from error in making judgments. So how then can anyone else, including me as Muhammad, aspire to, to be free from error? So Al-Ghazali explained that the prophet Muhammad was not free from error. And he explained these matters in details that the prophets make errors in judgment, including Muhammad. Okay, this is what's written in uh, Ghazali's work. And this is the top scholar that <clears throat> Islam ever produced. Now, this book here, what's interesting. So Dr. Saeed Ramadan al Buti, are you a doctor? Are you a, uh, well, just what's your, yeah, yeah, what's your qualification? So anyway, what he says is, okay, that, um, uh, sorry, somehow my, my notes got mixed up here, but, he says, if it was possible for the prophet to engage in judgment, then it follows it was possible for Muhammad's judgment to either be correct or incorrect. However, in those cases where Muhammad's judgment was incorrect, the error would not be allowed to remain. Rather, a Quranic verse would inevitably be revealed to him in order to correct Muhammad's mistaken judgment. If no such verse was revealed following the judgment, this indicated that Muhammad his judgment had been correct, being in accordance with the truth as known by Allah. So in other words, in this example, Muhammad is, Allah is angry with them because he frees these prisoners and Allah wanted them killed. So afterwards, Allah says to him, buddy, next time you capture people, slaughter them, all right? And Muhammad's like, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't realize. Because Muhammad got paid money for freeing these people. He got a ransom. And Allah said, I don't want you to take a ransom and make some money. Muhammad, I want you to kill them. So Muhammad made mistakes. And this book discusses the mistakes that Muhammad made and how abrogation was to fix Muhammad's mistakes. Yeah, you know, he, we have the, the top scholar in Islamic history here saying that Muhammad could make mistakes. But earlier we learned that the consensus of the scholars can never be mistaken. So it seems that the consensus of the scholars is the highest authority, not Muhammad. I've been saying that for a long time. <laughs> but yeah, but then if you read the Sharia, Muhammad can never be in error. Okay, whatever. But the scholars are saying that in the Sharia. The sc whatever. So in the back to the Sharia, seeking knowledge is an obligation upon every Muslim. So we'll be winding down now, ending up. So the meaning of this hadith, though the hadith itself is not well authenticated, in other words, being weak, it is true. The Sharia happily cites weak hadith. If it's in the Sharia, why can't we use them? I would assume, uh, yeah, yeah, since you don't like weak hadith and no Muslim does apparently, could you please get to Al-Ashar and, and Saudi Arabia and just tell them, guys, uh, weak hadith in the Sharia, that's wrong. Um, we're letting you know because we know you guys are the true scholars, right? So now moving on. So having discussed lies and forgeries, we must strictly distinguish them from the Hadith category called not well authenticated. 
Da'if, literally meaning weak. But the scholars use the term not well authenticated, so termed because of such factors as having a channel of transmission containing a narrator whose memory was poor, one who was unreliable, unidentified by name or other reasons. Such hadiths legally differ from forgeries in the permissibility of ascribing them to Muhammad. A weak hadith can legally be associated with Muhammad and you can derive legal judgment from it. You can create laws from it. If it is weak, how is it you can use it to make law? A good pause. question. Um, Yahya came up with a brilliant argument. He said that Muhammad is applying biblical teaching. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't we talk about earlier how Muslims have to borrow from the Bible because they have no confidence in the reliability of their own scriptures? Right. And then not only that, the Bible is Maudu. <laughs> You're like, well, if not Maudu, it's Matruk. It's rejected. So this, come on, dude. Like, seriously, it makes sense. It makes sense. Yeah, please, please. Yeah. So anyway, moving on. Yeah, it just makes no sense, that is. It just it makes absolutely no sense. Now, this is, again, the Reliance of the Traveler, right? Discussing weak hadith section W48.0, W48.0 from P9.5. Weak or da'if. Weak cannot simply be equated with false. We see that in the Sharia, right? Because it is possible to derive legal information from a weak hadith. Scholars do not reject them. So the fact that it's weak is not used as a simplistic expedient to eliminate these things because there is legal information connected with weak hadith. So these things carry the force of law. They are that important. So weak hadith are as valid as, as Sahih hadith. Yeah, you know, this is great. This quote here is great. That the, uh, Don't use this as a simplistic expedient to eliminate weak hadith, which is exactly how it's always applied in YouTube comments, as a simplistic expedient to re remove a hadith that's probably actually qualified as Sahih, but the person who is talking doesn't like. Exactly, exactly. So understand that they, they're not consistent with the use of their things and they don't want us to know this nonsense. So multiple means of transmission, section W48.2. When one and the same piece of information reaches us through several completely different channels, each though each one may or may not be trustworthy, even if it's not trustworthy, but it comes through multiple channels, the logical probability of the information's falsity is much reduced. If we receive the very same piece of information from 10 such channels, the possibility of its falsehood does not even come to mind. In other words, it's legit. <laughs> yes. Uh, Chaka summarized it perfectly. He says, this seems like circular reasoning here. And of course, that is what it is. No, Yahya, the Bible is not acceptable. He says the Bible is acceptable. It's revelation. Blah. No, according to your scholars, the Bible is not acceptable. Right. So, well, yeah, well, and then he said that it was messed up with insertions, et cetera. But how does he know the, the lines of that he thinks are about Muhammad aren't the insertions? Notice he's not giving us a single, he has never, ever, has he ever given me a single scholarly citation? Not one. Give me the name of the book, the name of the scholar, the page, the chapter. Give me a reference, a scholarly reference that shows what the doctrine of Islam is from its top scholars. Which school of fiqh do you belong to? Yahya, tell me, which school of fiqh there are four that are recognized, that are legal, the rest are outlawed, the rest are illegal. Tell me the name of the school you belong to. I will tell you who your scholars are, which Sharia manuals they use, which fiqh manuals they use, and then you can give me citations out of those manuals. So which school of fiqh do you belong to? Put it in the chat. Love to know, and I'll help you. You're slow, but I'm not speaking too fast for you, am I? So... <laughs> The verificatory principle has two important implications, one being the obligatory nature of belief in hadiths that are mutawatir. So the sharia, the sharia of Islam tells us it is obligatory to believe in hadiths that are mutawatir. So I'm not making this up, and the other scholars weren't making this up. It's here, recognized in the sharia. So multiple means of transmissions can raise a hadith from well-authenticated Hassan to Sahih, or from weak to Hassan. There you go. Yeah, interesting. And they give an example, but I, I skipped that. So, yeah. 
So there we go. So yeah, hadith can be, now weak hadith cannot be equated with false. They repeat this, weak hadith cannot be equated with false. Weak is an attribute of the hadith's chain of transmission. False is an attribute of the hadith's text. These are two different things. These are two different things, right? So yeah. So anyway, they talk about blah, 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 blah. We'll skip that. So almost to the end, when the person who has related a hadith is an Islamic scholar of the first rank, it is not enough for a student or popular writer to find one chain of transmission for the hadith that is weak, right? He can say, well, that chain is weak, but yeah, the other chains are accepted, right? So therefore that hadith is not elevated. There are a great many hadiths with several chains of transmission and adequate scholarly treatment of how these affect hadiths or authenticity has been held to require a master, a hafiz, right? So you need to get a scholar to actually look at this and give you a judgment, the hafiz. And a hafiz like Bukhari, Muslim, Dahabi, Ibn Kathir, or Siyuti, who have memorized at least 100,000 hadiths, their texts, the chains of transmission and significance to undertake the comparative study of the Hadith's various chains of transmission that cannot be accurately assessed without such knowledge. I'll finish this and then we can comment on this. Today, not one Hadith master remains in the Muslim community. We do not accept the judgment of any would-be reclassifiers of Hadith, no matter how large their popular following, unless it is corroborated by the work of previous Hadith masters. Is that clear? Yes. Excellent stuff. You know, even, even, the, even the most educated scholarly Muslim isn't allowed to reclassify Hadith today. So I'm not quite sure why YouTube commenters think they can. Yeah. He went to the school of his town in Lebanon, Al Ola School for Boys, like school of fiqh, dude. You know you're being dishonest. I know you're being, we all know you're being dishonest. You know, Shafi. Hanbali, Maliki, Hanafi, pick one, dude. Seriously, pick one. Put it in the comments. I'll help you understand what your scholars said. Because <laughs> quite bluntly, we are the scholars now. So, hadith are a pitfall. The few hadith which can be understood adequately without referring to the often complex debates which have taken place concerning them between the scholars. That is Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad. This man is currently Dean of Cambridge Muslim College UK, which trains imams for British mosques. He was voted in 2010 Britain's most influential Muslim thinker by Jordan's Royal Islamic Strategic Studies Center. This man's a PhD. This man runs university center, right? He translated a number of books from Arabic, including sections of Imam Ghazali's Ikhya Ulum al Din. So he says, you can't just look at a hadith. You need to understand, you need to go read the scholarly writing. So he knows this. And he says, Sufyan, he goes on to say, Sufyan Ibn Umayna, the great early hadith scholar, used to remark, the hadith are a pitfall except for the scholars for this reason. And he, this is interesting. He says, no Muslim scholar of repute uses a hadith before checking the commentaries to ascertain its meaning and application. We don't have those commentaries. This is true. Yeah. So we are arguing, why are we doing exegesis of stuff that was done a thousand years ago? We need to go see what the scholars are saying, and we can find that. There's loads of references you can find. You'll find these things all over the place. We don't have those exact ones, but man, they exist. You can find things. Now, tafsir of hadith. Hafiz was a term used for the scholars of hadith, specifically one who had committed 100,000 hadiths to memory. The most important of all hadith collections is our Jami Asahi of Imam al-Bukhari, Gauged with the fact that at least 70 commentaries have been written on the Sahih. Ever seen one? Ever? No. no. I haven't. You know, nope. I, disc I discovered this existed only recently, right? Like less than a year ago. The most celebrated tafsir of Bukhari is without question the magnificent Fat al-Bari, the victory of the creator by Sheikh al-Islam, Imam Hajar al-Asqalani. Remember, he's a Sheikh al-Islam, so that means he's one of the 28 top scholars Islam ever produced, Right? So appreciated by the ulama for the doctrinal soundness of its author, complete coverage of Bukhari's material, mastery of the relevant Arabic sciences, the wisdom it shows in drawing lessons, and its skill in resolving disputes over variant readings. 
You see, he refuses to answer which school of fiqh he belongs to because he's not here to be honest. Yahya is here to confuse. He's here to confuse the issue. Understand, his job, he's doing, he's following a doctrine called commanding the right and forbidding the wrong. We are doing wrong. So he has to impose the Sharia law on us. He has to make sure that we are unable because for him to allow us to engage in disobedience is itself disobedience. And he takes it upon himself as he's following the Fad al kifaya communal obligation, to make sure that he's serving Allah. He believes he's being righteous. He believes he's being moral. He believes he is doing good by lying. Think about that. So moving on. Now, this is the cover of the book and the back cover. So, yeah. So now he, so Bukhari apparently, last couple of slides, four slides, Bukhari questioned more than 1,000 scholars of Hadith. How? I don't know. Maybe he questioned the guy next door. I don't know. Can you prove it? <laughs> apparently, he questioned people from Nishapur in, in India, Hijaz, Egypt, Iraq. I think he flew Emirates. I'm not sure. Could have been Qatar Airways. Maybe Air Lebanon. I don't know. We don't have the records. Do you see, did you see any records of how he got around that is? Yeah, you know, all the, the information we have for, on him, which isn't much, comes from much later people. So it's almost like they yeah. could have just made up whatever information they wanted about him. Yeah. So apparently he prayed before recording any hadith. Oh, what a good man. What a good man. He weighed every word with scrupulous accuracy. He devoted more than a quarter of his life to the Sahih, now considered as an authority second only to the Quran, whatever. Then, al-Bukhari's notion to compile the Sahih apparently was because of a casual remark from blah, 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 who said that he wished that a scholar would compile a short but comprehensive book containing only the Sahih Hadith, the genuine Hadith. So, Bukhari sifted through all the Hadith known to man, known to him, testing their genuineness according to criteria he personally developed. We have no idea what those criteria are. Nobody knows. He selected 7,275 out of 600,000 hadith. I, I read through 600,000 hadith in like a day. How about you, Thaddeus? <laughs> well, um, uh, one, your, your video is frozen, just so you know. Um, but someone asked earlier if he could have possibly oh, wow. done that. So I did the math. And... Uh, if he did uh, every day, it's 365 days a year for 10 years. Uh, all right, your video is fixed now. It was still frozen there for a second. Uh, he would have to evaluate 164 hadith a day. Now, he could certainly read 164 hadith in a day, but how is he going to, uh, you know, these scholars in different parts of the world and questioning them about the accuracy of these hadith? And doing 164 of them a day—that's that—that's that, quite a feat, there. Uh, you know, if he was doing uh, this for 12 hours, that'd be like 14 hadith an hour, or you know, like two minutes, or sorry, three minutes a hadith. And he supposedly gave them. Or, so if he did this 12 hours a day, 365 days a year for 10 years then he could devote three minutes to each hadith, which is barely enough time to read it, let alone evaluate its accuracy. I, I think it's pretty clear that this number is just totally made up. He probably evaluated, I don't know, 10,000 hadith and kept 7,000 or something like that. Exactly. This is, I mean, this story is just, you can see they just made this up. It's, yeah, he took flying carpet airlines out of Persia, obviously, and that's how he got around, right? Now, Bukhari nowhere mentioned, and this is taken from the Tafsir Sai Bukhari, right? He nowhere mentions, I'm quoting this out of the way, he nowhere mentions what criteria he applied to traditions to test the authenticity. He's like, ah, it looks good to me. I think that was his criteria, <laughs> right? All explains why he compiled the book the way he did. So many later scholars tried to figure it out, okay? And none of them could quite figure out. So they've all kind of figured out what they think he was doing, but no one actually knows. Now, he also chose hadith that were handed down from the prophet on the authority of a well-known companion via continuous chain of narrators, or so he said. Okay? So, according to his records, his research and his knowledge, apparently, you know, these had been unanimously accepted by honest and trustworthy Hadith scholars, as men and women of integrity, possessed of a retentive memory and firm faith. So they said, we can trust these Hadith because they come from people who are legit from 150 years ago that were good people, great memories. 
So Bukhari also used a hadith from other reliable authorities that was said to be free from defects. Do they give us more info? No, they don't. Al-Bukhari included these narrations when they explicitly state that they had received the hadith from their own authorities. So if a dude got it from his imam, it's legit. You just say, okay, that goes in. If their statement was ambiguous, Bukhari took care that they had demonstrably met their teachers and they were not people known to make careless statements. From these principles, okay, you can see that Bukhari's caution is evident, whatever. Al-Bukhari's purpose was not only to collect what he considered to be sound, but to impress the contents of the mind of the readers, but also to show them what doctrinal and legal inferences could be drawn from them. This is the substance of ultimately Islamic law. I'll pause there for a moment. So last two slides. Yeah, I want to make one comment. I, you know, it's totally insane that he didn't explain his methods at all. And yet this is the single most reliable hadith collection, yep. according to Islam, that as far as we know, he just randomly picked and choose. Uh, I mean, it's entirely 100% dependent on his reliability. So it's, it's, a, it's you know, the chain has collapsed to one person. It, it's Imam Bakari, and he doesn't even give you any information to verify that he used good methods. And in fact, I've read that, you know, scholars who've gone back and, you know, primarily Western scholars and tried to apply the criteria that later scholars came up with to Bakari show that there are numerous hadith that shouldn't be graded Sahi in his collection by their own standards. So essentially, yep. he just, picked some things, and then they tried to invent standards to match what he picked. Right. So, yeah, I mean, it's a mess. It's a, it's a total mess. And then thanks for doing the maths there earlier. I mean, that shows this, this, this just doesn't work out. How do you assess their friends, their opinions? Their... And I asked him which school of fiqh he follows, and he says, my own. This means <laughs> he's an apostate. He's nobody. He follows his own personal religion that he invented. Right. He is no longer he's violating the Quran. He's flat out violating even the Quran. How can he claim to be a Muslim? Right. If he's following his own thing, doing his own thing. Right. So obviously he doesn't want to answer because then we can pin him down. If he answers, we can then pin him down on exactly the doctrine that he supposedly follows. But he he, he belongs to one of these schools. He's just lying to us because he wants to confuse us. I'm sorry. Dude, we know Islam better than you do. I know this stuff way better than you ever will. We are the scholars now. You are the students. So, now, Sheikh al-Islam, Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, he, so he divided his book, right? Sorry, his work into more than 100 books. Each one subdivided into, sorry, 3,450 chapters. So it's huge work. Every chapter heading indicates the contents of the various traditions. So he categorized them all. So he, apparently it says, you know, this is just fluff. At the age of 12, he was leading Ramadan prayers in Mecca at 12. And he spent time in a house that looked directly on the black stone. You've got to ask yourself, how come does the black stone in Mecca wear a burqa? <laughs> it's not wearing a, a men's dish dash. It's wearing a female's burqa. Ask yourself that question. That's really a question everyone needs to ask yourself. Why is the Blackstone dressed in women's clothing? And that's a legit. I know I say weird things, man, but maybe I know a few things about Islam. It's, it's almost like it's one of those daughters of Allah that we've heard about, but apparently actually were given by Satan and Muhammad couldn't tell the difference or something. Um, yeah, well, yeah, you know, you know, I've, I've said in the past is that the Quran is irrelevant and I, I kind of mean that 90%. Yeah, so, so let me not make the statement that I would make, but, but, but yeah, ask yourself, why is the Kaaba dressed in women's clothing, not men's clothing? Just ask yourself that. So anyway, in Cairo, the imam wrote some of the most thorough and beneficial books ever added to the library of Islamic civilization. And these are blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. And he really, and also he wrote a commentary on the 40 hadith of Sheikh al-Islam, Imam al-Nawawi, one of the most famous scholars in Islam, and the guy that actually ultimately really was the source for the reliance of the traveler okay so he was the top scholar of the shafi'i school he was the crowning scholar of the shafi'i school of islam shafi was the man who created the ideas of the schools of fiqh he did that in baghdad or in iraq and he was the first man to codify the, the rules of fiqh and then the other schools followed after him imam hajar died in 852 and even the christians grieved when he died he was such a good man i mean this is just like such comic book material that they write it's crazy and now, some vocabulary, last two slides, last slide. 
Sheikh al-Islam is an honorific title for outstanding scholars of the Islamic sciences given to jurists whose fatwas were particularly influential, right? In the classical era, it meant was reserved for the ulama and the mystics. There are 28 scholars who have received this title. Ulama means scholar, literally the learned ones, the feminine alima or uluma. Now, these ulama are the guardians. They are the transmitters and the interpreters of religious knowledge in Islam, including Islamic doctrine and law. So these weirdos that we've been talking about in this presentation are the transmitters of the Quran. They're guardians of the Quran. They're the interpreters of the Quran. And you can see by their rules that they make stuff up as they go along. And now the final two slides. Should I pause there or just finish, Thaddeus? Uh, you can just go on. So this is from the notes about the translation of the Fat al-Bari. From, the translation of Adith is from 1 to 30 from the Fat al-Bari. was done by the students of knowledge studying in both Medina, Munawara, and Egypt at Al-Azhar. These are the top two Islamic scholarly universities in the world. Right? Al-Azhar is the top one regarded as a thousand years old. It's the most highly regarded Islamic authority in the world. This is the methodology they employed in translating the hadith from the Fat al-Bari. We will translate the meaning of the explanation rather than translating the explanation verbatim. We will exclude anything that we deem irrelevant for the English reader and beginner level student of knowledge, such as in-depth discussion of language issues or issues surrounding the narrators. Any narration that Ibn Hajar himself classifies as weak will be removed from the translation. And then the final two slides, or just one and a half slides, it should be noted, this was done at the discretion of the students at Medina because removing weak hadith from works was not the example of the hadith scholars. Otherwise, Imam Ibn Hajar would not have included weak hadith in the Fat al-Bari as sources to take knowledge from. Weak hadith are used to support opinions because a weak hadith containing the words of Muhammad is preferred over pure opinion and personal judgment. Weak hadith are used to support legal opinions, okay? Legal opinions. Because a weak hadith containing the words of Muhammad is preferred over opinion and personal judgment. This is the example set by the scholars, including Bukhari himself, who used them deliberately in his work, Al-Adab al-Mufrad. The Sahih of Imam Bukhari is a collection of the Sahih only, not a collection of the only hadith that scholars use. The scholars themselves state a Sahih hadith has about a 99 to 100% chance of being entirely accurate. A Hassan hadith has about an 85 to 99% chance of being entirely accurate. A Da'if hadith has about a 45 to 85% chance of being entirely accurate. This is the widest band of accuracy. Even a fabricated hadith, a, a, a Maudu hadith, has a 45% chance of being accurate. Since the grading it was given may have been wrong, the fabricator may have spoken the truth in this instance. So weak hadith should not be treated like fabricated hadith because an 85% chance of being entirely accurate is a very high chance. Final slide. If a person received 85% on his test scores, would he throw that out saying that isn't worth anything? Each hadith is treated individually. There is no such thing in Islam as banning an entire grade of hadiths from being used. Even fabricated hadith are still studied because one scholar may grade it fabricated while another may grade it sahih. And there are many famous examples among the scholars of this occurring. End. Excellent. Um, so people have been pushing back on Yahya a little bit more. Um, one comment I particularly like from Andrew Martin he says, see, you know that Islam is false. That's why you're rejecting what Islam is teaching and substituting your own made up school of fiqh. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he rejects the foundation of Islam and says he's a Muslim. I'm like, no, you're not. So I will stop sharing here. So hopefully that made it clear. I hope everyone saw these slides and understands. I will pause yeah. there. And yeah, I, I uh, you know, I personally found it very informative and very helpful. You know, there's a lot of confusion. I think it's often intentional on the part of Muslims in the, the comment sections. Sometimes they're actually just confused themselves and other times they're purposely trying to confuse us, make us look at the wrong things. Um, you know, this, the, the, it's a weak hadith being, being a prime example um, because to us it, that makes it sound like it, it's probably not true, but to them that could mean it's 
up to 85% chance of being true. And if there's <laughs> two weak Hadith that say the same thing, then it might jump to 90% or something. And I, I think most people would probably accept something that's 90% true. Yeah, but they don't know these classifications. Remember, and don't forget the Mutawatara Hadith, they have to accept it as if they were witnesses to it. Yeah, yes, absolutely. Um, the other thing that uh, Yahya said is that there are over 7,000 hadith. It's impossible that all are acceptable. Well, that, that's some interesting logic because I'm pretty sure there's over 7,000 words in the Quran. Uh, does that mean it's impossible that those could all be acceptable too? Or does that logic only work when you want to arbitrarily reject hadith you don't like? And of course, most notably, he likes to reject the, I don't know, two dozen Sahih Hadith that say Aisha is six or yeah, sometimes exactly. seven at age of marriage and nine at age of consummation. And then he, he looks at yeah. some other Hadith that are vague and does takes like five of them, stacks them up, does some math and, oh, magically, she's 18. Well, you, you know what actual scholars of Islam say about that? They, they say that that is a joke and yeah. you shouldn't apologize for your prophet. Yeah, I mean, do people follow him? If he's following his own personal religion, who follows him? But also, that, that's a stupid statement from him because, look, we've just read through the classifications. We're not saying they're all Sahih, they're all Hassan, they're all Daif. We're saying, look, these are the classifications, and the, the scholars have given them classifications already. We know. They, they're already, they've been classified. We don't have to go wonder. We can just go look at them. So, yeah, I mean, he's just confusing the issues. He's just trying to run defense for Islam. I mean, he's, he's, he's doing it because his imam sent him. He's not running his own religion. He's like, tell us that. Uh, Chako Kurian asked, are you going to do a series on the Sufis? Now, probably, probably not. Look, the thing is, if I start talking about the Sufis, let me explain to you. I'm going to start sounding like I'm telling you that I saw Bigfoot. Okay? And I mean that. I mean that very seriously. Honest, I'm going to start sounding like I'm the guy that presents ancient aliens. <laughs> Seriously, man, they're going to make memes out of me if I start talking about the Sufis. Right, Thaddeus? <laughs> yeah. Um, there, there's some really bizarre stuff in, in Sufi teachings for sure. Yeah. So, look, man, um, I'll tell you this much. The Sufis are the pinnacle. They are the elite within Islam. Disregard anything you're told by any of these idiots in the comment sections. The Sufis are the top echelon. They are the top elite in Islam. They are. There is no higher than the Sufis. Ghazali was a Sufi. Many of the Sheikh al-Islam were Sufis. All of the top translators are Sufis. All of the people who established the schools of fiqh were either Sufis or were trained by Sufis. The Sufis are highly influential, but they like to remain in the shadows. They don't want to be in the forefront. They, they keep it very quiet. The Sufis are mystics. They, they deal in mystical magic, ritual magic. They follow a thing called light mysticism. It gets weird. And when you start reading their books, that stuff gets weird. But they... <laughs> It, it's really weird. I mean, seriously. And um, yeah, as I said, I'm going to sound really, I'm going to sound freaky if I start like I'm on drugs, if I start talking about that stuff. It's, it's, um, but understand they run Islam. They're, they're at the top of Islam. They are regarded as the saints of Islam. And uh, one simple example um, in Al Ghazali's uh, Mishkat Al Anwar, I think it'd be two examples then. Uh, in the Mishkat Al Anwar, they speak of that because they did a thing called light mysticism. Allah is the illuminator, right? Or the illuminant. They are the illuminated. And as a group, the Sufis are the Illuminati. In fact, Al-Ghazali writes it as the, the Sufis are the perfect Illuminati. The perfect Illuminati. And that's just one example of what you'll find in their books, right? There's plenty of those. It's just, it just it's a weird place when you start reading this stuff. Absolutely. Uh, just take a, a couple of quick comments from the chat, and then if there's nothing you want to address, we can sign off. Um, Joe DeMars called you Shake Lloyd, which I think is quite appropriate. And uh, Andy Drymer said, when a religion starts out as a lie, you have to lie more to keep the lie of Islam going. And I, I think that, that that should definitely be one of the, the takeaways. You know, you end up with insane positions like Matthew is unreliable because there's not multiple chains from Jesus to Matthew, as if that 
even make sense when you're only talking about from one person to one person. Uh, what you instead need to do is you need to pass something orally for uh, you know a long time, so you have lots and lots of people who know the same material. You can't write it down right away. You got to wait. If you write it down right away, that's not reliable. If you if you wait several generations and then they you know, you got five versions of it floating around and you can cross check them and, and uh, have one, one um, important person decide which one is accurate and throw out the rest and put it in his Sahi book. Well, that, that's beyond question. That is absolutely 100% true. And that's why you have, you have to just, you know, when you, you start out with something that's totally insane, like Islam, you have to come up with insane ways to justify it. Yeah, yeah. Any comments from the audience? Did you guys learn something from this? Does this clarify what's going on in Islam and show you how the scholars really run the show and the, the Quran has been superseded by Hadith and and their own comments and opinions on it and how important the Sharia is? Yeah, definitely let us know if this material was helpful, whether you'd like to see us do more introductory shows like this. Um, one thing that we thought might be another good thing to talk about which we didn't, we kind of alluded to today, but it's how the, the Quran does not pass the criteria that are used to judge the reliability of the Hadith. The Quran, by their own standards, should be considered, uh, you know, quite unreliable, yet somehow it's beyond question that the Quran could be unreliable, so they don't apply the standards to it. They just totally ignore them. The, whether we're talking about the, you know, the main versions, the the um, 1929 uh, Egyptian edition, also known as the Hafs, that people used almost universally today. You look at the supposed isnas of it, and it's got multiple unreliable narrators in the chain, but it's the Quran, so it doesn't matter. Uh, the Quran was supposedly handed from Allah to Jibreel alone, to Muhammad alone, one to one. Uh, that supposedly would make it unreliable, but it's the Quran, so it doesn't matter. We don't have any evidence from it going from Muhammad to any specific group of people either. We only have a, a chain for the vision once it was written down after that fact. So we don't have any, any chain back to Muhammad even. Uh, but it's the Quran, so somehow that doesn't matter. Yeah, crazy stuff. Uh, I just thought I'd show this. This is from the Mishkat al Anwar of Ghazali. And then he says that the perfect Illuminati perceived that Al Mutta, the obeyed one, is not more than the highest other than absolute deity and is related to him as the sun to his central light. Now, when you read this, this, this stuff is like, you know, the guy in the matrix at the end who's just waffles, whatever that dude is called, the chairman or whatever. It's gobbledygook of the same. It's just crazy stuff. But understand the Sufis regard themselves as the perfect Illuminati. Okay because of their light mysticism. And when they speak of the obeyed one, they're talking about Muhammad, who is not more than the highest other than absolute deity and is related to Allah as the sun to essential light. Muhammad is the light of Allah. Muhammad is a piece of Allah, light that Allah projected out of himself. And then he sent that light into all the prophets, into Jesus and into, and eventually that light was born in the world as a man called Muhammad. Do you understand? This, this, this stuff is bananas. I'll stop there, but it's bananas when you read it. It's yeah, it's crazy stuff. And you know, that's just the tip of the iceberg there when you get into the, the Sufi <laughs> beliefs. Yeah. yeah. But that's but don't email. don't worry, the great scholar of Yahyaism, it, he's collected all the differences between the Hoffs and the Warsh, and he's gonna upload a video that explains how it happened. Well, well, good. Let, let, let's be extremely generous and say you actually say something of value in that video. Well, you only got 36 more Arabic Qurans to explain uh, approximately 90,000 different textual variants. I, yeah. I, you, you should be busy for a while. You know, you, you do uh, 10 different textual variants a day for, let's see, how long would that take? That would take you 24 years. So you got right. Material for the next 24 years, tackle 10 textual variants of the Quran a day for the next 24 years, and, and then maybe we'll be convinced that Islam is true. We'll see. Yeah. Also, one, one interesting argument, and I heard this from someone in the chat, and I can't remember who, but I learned a lot there. God 
swears on himself in one verse in the in the Bible because he is the greatest of creation. He, there's nothing greater than him that he can swear upon. But apparently Allah swears on all in heaven, basically all that is seen and unseen, which is a quote taken out of the Nicene Creed, oddly enough. But but Allah swears on all that is seen and unseen because Allah is unable to swear upon himself. Because when you swear, you have to do so upon something greater than you. So if everything in creation that you see and don't see is greater than you, you are less. You are the least of creation. And in the Bible, in Genesis, the, the serpent is the least of creation. So, you know, ponder that. And uh, Yahya did acknowledge that 90,000 textual variants is more than he can explain. But according to uh, Sheikh Yasser Qadi and the consensus of the scholars, which means that it is beyond question, all of those versions all came from Allah and all went through Muhammad. So you, you got some work to do, or you can just admit that the Quran is not perfectly preserved and that Islam is just telling lies when they say it is. Of course, that means that it's also false since all the promises to pr protect the book from corruption in it. So difficult uh, questions to decide there for sure. Yeah. So what did, what did everyone learn today? Seriously, Yahya should just, just, just go away so we can just talk about this issue. <laughs> distractor, yeah, as a true distractor. What did everyone learn today? And how is this useful to you? And what about you, Thaddeus? What did you take away from this? What did you gain and learn? It's... Yeah, so a, a couple things from our, our recent conversations, um, you know, prepping for this and, and the material itself uh, that I take as the, the main takeaways. One is that the when Muslims say that the Bible is corrupted, they don't mean what we think they mean. They don't mean that the, there's textual variants. Yeah, they'll, they'll grab a, a, a critic of the, the New Testament who, who says that there are textual variants and they'll claim that that's proof. But what they really mean is that it doesn't have multiple chains of narration going back to Jesus, um, which it can't because, you know, it's directly connected to Jesus. So it'd be impossible for there to be multiple chains. So they define that as corruption. That's the one thing. And the other one that I really take away from our, our recent talks is that this analogy that the Sharia law is like the, the Talmud of Islam. Now, obviously that might not be helpful for everyone since not everyone is you know super versed in what the Talmud is, but it exactly fits and it makes a lot of sense given that so much of Islam seems to be borrowed from Judaism. Uh, the, this is just a, a hypothesis. I, I don't have anything to back it, but it seems like a reasonable possibility is that Islam was actually founded, <clears throat> but but which I mean, you know, what we call Islam today, not what Muhammad taught, was actually uh, founded by a group of heretical rabbis who were trying to uh, synchronize several different religions, but they drew most heavily from what they knew, which is Judaism which would explain why there's so much material taken from the Talmud and would explain why the legal structure is so similar. Yeah. Let's see what other people said. Yeah, let's just put this edit in timeout, please. <laughs> uh, I, I do agree that Yaya was, was polite and somewhat on topic today, he, but... It, Definitely, we, we're trying to wrap up now, so no need for further distraction at this point. <clears throat> uh, yeah, so tell us your takeaways. We want you to uh, apply this material, use this material, share it, hopefully um, use it to better understand how Muslims think about issues so that you can better reach them. You know, I... I, I did try to make, I, we do try to make these shows entertaining, but entertainment isn't our goal right here. Our goal is education and uh, for more importantly, for people to apply it. You know, if you get a bunch of knowledge and you don't apply it, uh, that's probably not all that beneficial. But if you take the knowledge and you use it to better reach Muslims, then, you know, we're really happy. We're, we're very satisfied with our work. Yeah. Yeah. This is, Look, I, I also, I appreciate 
I'm Thaddeus again. I mean, I appreciate that you take the time to do this and uh, work with me on these because, you know, it's uh, I, I, your perspective is really, really helpful. You've, you've helped me so much. We have a request here from uh, Joe DeMars, which I'm sure you'll be happy to hear that he said um, he, we should do videos defending Paul and videos defending the early church. Um, as it so happens, we are considering doing a video on Paul next. I've been talking about it for weeks. <laughs> In fact, <laughs> I did the research ages ago. Yeah, I've got about two dozen presentations ready to go. We just haven't had time to get to <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's always difficult to decide what to do next. Uh, that the, the tricky part isn't finding things to talk about in Islam that are are false. The the, <laughs> the tricky part is deciding which ones are most important to get to. Yeah. So yeah, I hope this gave you a new perspective. It's not the standard average talk about hadith. Um, hopefully, this opened your eyes. I mean, in in your case, this also opened your eyes to how hadith really relate to us as Christians, to the Bible, and to how Muslims think. Yeah, and you know, knowing the the criteria, the average Muslim might not know this criteria, but if we can quote the criteria and then show how, if they consistently applied them to the Bible, then they would have to judge it as reliable as well. Should should give any thinking person some pause for sure. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So look, that's it for me. Um, yeah. Look, if you can, please um, subscribe to my channel. I, I do put up content there. I'm thinking of starting to do Q&A live streams, and I'm thinking to do short Q&As on the Sharia, do a short series on the Sharia, like five minutes, like little videos just describing to introduce people to what it is and how it works and how it interprets the Quran and supersedes the Quran and the and so on. And um, But yeah, if you give me ideas, I'll be happy to consider those and do short videos. And uh, hope to see you more on this channel, you know, so um, tell your friends about it use the stuff. If you have questions, let me know. I do engage in the comments. Yeah, excellent. We had several comments saying how that was very informative and uh, how they really appreciate the topic. So let us know in the chat, since we're about to sign off, what other topics you'd like to see us cover in the near future. And um, we'll try to give priority to the things people are most interested in. Thank you all for joining us today. Have a great rest of your day, whether that is just beginning or whether it is coming to an end, depending on what part of the world you are in. Uh, thanks for joining us and God bless. Good night, guys.